And now I invite and super excited to hear the presentation of Dr. Desiree Larenas Linaman from Mexico City. Uh, she's a head of UCARE Medical Center uh, of UCARE. So please um, let us know more about chronic urticaria. Yeah, thank you so much, I stay. And thank you so much, Marcus. It was really a wonderful first part of our session and we are really thrilled here to be with you, our patients from all over the world, listening to us directly now or even maybe a little bit later via videotape, you know, because it's gonna be videotaped, it's gonna be translated. So um, for me to, to speak a little bit about chronic urticaria and surely I would like to retake a little bit the, um, the ideas that Marcus already spoke about. Now, reminding you, what is urticaria? Mm, urticaria is a disease where the cells just under the surface of your skin get activated. We saw this already, already a little bit in the video Marcus showed us. And uh, once they get activated, they free a lot of histamine into their environment. And the histamine then causes the swelling, the itchy, the redness, et cetera, et cetera. So if this is very superficial, just below your skin, we get the expression of wheels. Now you can see here another, again, another picture of wheels with many pictures of wheels. But if this swelling is a little bit more down in, in your skin, then we get the angioedema. Many times patients come to me when they started up with wheels and I say, now I already also got the other thing and that's the swelling. So what's this other disease? And then I tell them, no, this is just another expression of the same disease. And actually when they only come with hives, I already tell them it is often that also sometime maybe they can get some angioedema in, into your disease. And this is just the same thing. It's your only expression of an inflammation a little bit deeper in the skin. This can be in the lips, this can be in the eyebrows, in the, in the, in the eyelids, sorry, or this can be also in, uh, in the joints as Marcus already showed us in a picture. So here I draw for you, uh, again, this skin, I don't have a nice video, but I always like to draw a little bit. Uh, so I make my drawings myself. Here is the mast cell just below the skin. You can see it has several different receptors. That means it can respond to different stimuli. So there's different kinds of stimuli that can make the mast cell activated. And then, yes, it liberates into, it produces into the environment histamine that was stored in these little granules you see here inside the mast cell. But once it gets stimulated, it gets into environment, histamine, more histamine, and more and more histamine. And then the histamine is one of the major molecules that makes all the symptoms. So I already told you now that, that urticaria is this disease where we have two different expressions. One is the wheels, which happens in 50% of the patients that they only have wheels. Then there's about 10% of patients who only have angioedema. And then there's more or less a 40% who has both of them, wheels and then sometimes also angioedema added to it. Well, the wheels can be of different sizes and of different ways they look. Now, they can be large, several centimeters. They can even be flowing the one into the other. You saw also some pictures from Marcus there, but they can also be very tiny little wheels. These pinpoint lesions, as we call them, are also wheels and sometimes not recognized as wheels. This is a very typical picture of cholinergic urticaria. Our colleague is gonna speak about a little bit later. And then now each wheel um, never lasts for more than 24 hours. I think that's the important part. And I always like to accompany when I speak about urticaria to differentiate it from other skin diseases that also itch with this nice um, yeah, flower, uh, these nice flowers from Van Gogh. I'm originally Dutch, so I always love Van Gogh, as I think many of you will. So this really explains me, uh, urticaria, the skin is healthy. The skin as such is okay. There's no problems in the skin barrier. The skin is not dried out. The skin is, has not had alterations. But below the skin, the mast cells make the problems. So when the wheels go away, the skin, there's nothing else to see in the skin. The skin looks normal again. This is important because quite some people come to me and they are treating themselves with 
topical cortico corticosteroids. And, and then they have a wheel here, and then they put a corticosteroid here, and then it's not the correct treatment. That will be the correct treatment for this disease, which is called atopic eczema or atopic dermatitis. And here you see I accompany this patient with the dried uh, old flowers also from Van Gogh. Now here the skin is dried out. You can see the lesions who stay within the same, in the same place for quite a long time, several days normally, also very itchy. That's the same as with an urticaria. Also much more itchy at night. That's the same as with urticaria. And I very much agree. I think it's because of the cortisol going down, our own cortisol going down in the night. But here the skin is really dried. You have scaly things. And sometimes you even get scars after this. So this is not urticaria. And the treatment is very different from the treatment of urticaria. And then also a very important thing. Now, because um, if colleagues, uh, neighbors, family members, but also physicians, see a patient with hives, see a patient with, with the wheels, with urticaria. They say, oh, oh be, be, be careful, be careful, because it can go inside and then you can't breathe anymore. And, and then the patient who already felt himself not good because of so much itch now also gets scared. And this is not correct because urticaria is not anaphylaxis and I will here show you what is then anaphylaxis. Well, anaphylaxis, I've got my point over that last, anaphylaxis is when I can have wheels on my skin, but at the same time, I have coughing, I have wheezing, the disease attacks my bronchi, my lungs, and I can get nervous, I, I get, get uh, anxious that something wrong will happen and uh, I get a, a, a fast heartbeat. You know, we call this tachycardia. Uh, I can even feel a little bit fainted or when a patient is starting to get anaphylaxis, many organs get involved and they can even vomit or from feel nauseous or get diarrhea, get stomach cramps. So anaphylaxis, yes, has wheels, but many times has many of the other organs involved as well. And surely this is a medical emergency, but it's not urticaria. So don't be afraid. Urticaria is very bothersome, but it's not dangerous. Marcus already told us as well, the differentiation with hereditary angioedema when you only get the swellings. Now, chronic urticaria, coming finally down to chronic urticaria, um, this is when the wheels, now they come and go, they come and go, but during a lapse of time of more than six weeks. Then we have the chronic spontaneous urticaria. Oops. Then we have the chronic spontaneous urticaria, where you can see that the wheels just come out. You don't have to do anything to your skin, and the wheels just spontaneously come out. It can be because of you took a certain drug or because of your very rarely, and this is more the acute urticaria, ate some, some kind of foods but just the wheels come out without you doing anything to your skin. Then we have the other, that is the chronic inducible or inducible urticaria, where you have to stretch your skin to get the hives or get cold to your skin, or my colleague is gonna speak about that a little bit later. So I will go a little bit further into the chronic spontaneous urticaria. I already told you, we have here this mast cell. And so there's many different triggers in chronic spontaneous urticaria that could trigger the mast cell without us knowing it, without us seeing this. No, but it's a mechanism that's taking place within your skin. This can be due to complements. Complement are little substances that, that are freed into the environment of my skin and of my body when I have infections. So that's uh, more, much more in, 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 in uh, uh, acute urticaria with viral infections. But we can also see this with chronic infections, for example, a not well diagnosed sinusitis or a not well diagnosed now abscess of one of the of the, the teeth, um, or yeah, very rarely other chronic infection. So it's always important if you really have a very uh, difficult to treat, difficult to control chronic urticaria to rule out a chronic infections if there are any signs. But this is really something specific for your physician. Then there's autoallergy. Now my, my own antibodies start to attack certain molecules probably in my skin and then all of a sudden activating the mast cell and getting again this histamine out. 
or autoantibodies. This often goes together with thyroid disease. No, uh, I have my thyroid uh, gland working too fast or too slow, and that sometimes is because of something what we call autoimmunity. Or important part here as well, I'll come back to that, is the neuropeptides. And as I already showed you, I only know the lab at the very end, add this allergy because chronic spontaneous urticaria is very, very rarely due to a specific allergy. I had one patient who all of a sudden started to put uh, nuts into her uh, diet in the morning, every morning, every morning now for several months already, and she was allergic to nuts. But this has been one patient among all the other chronic spontaneous urticaria patients who were not allergic to anything. Then there are certain foods that do make my mast cell like more, more uh, nervous and more easily to get histamine out of it. And we call that histamine releasing foods or additives. So sometimes it might be helpful if some of those foods you try not to eat too much when you really have your urticaria activated. But neuropeptides are important. I always leave it in my interrogation till the very end. And what about emotional stress? What about something that really made you feel bad or made you feel very happy? And very, very often when the wheels get a flare, when the wheels get out of control, there's this uh, emotional part uh, that comes to it. No, not because of it's the cause, no, but it's just one of the extra triggers that makes your urticaria go out of control. I oftentimes send my patients, now go and have your sport, go and do your exercise, go and get rid, have your meditation, your yoga, go and get rid of this emotional part that you're not able to control. So we can control your urticaria better. And then there's this way of uh, measuring a bit, now um, your urticaria, how well is your urticaria controlled? And it's called the urticaria control test. I don't know why. Here the title got away, but anyways, <laughs> my slides are playing a bit a game with me today. Now, this is four questions that you can ask yourself uh, over the last few weeks. How much did your urticaria bother you? How much did you not control? And you get points. And according to the points, you can say you're well controlled if you have 12 or more points, or you're not so well controlled, you'd better adjust your therapy. Now, then I come the last two minutes to the treatment. The treatment is given in different steps according to the severity and according to the way you, re re you respond to the, the therapy. If you don't do well with one normal antihistamine taking uh, normally in the evening, you know, because it's when your hives go a little bit more out of control, then we can go and up those. Also, we have antihistamines, normal dose, the newer ones, yes, we don't like at all to go with the older ones, the, those that give you uh, make you sleepy, those that even interfere when you're driving. Um, no, we don't like those. And we really should try to not take those anymore. Um, we really like you to take the newer antihistamines. And if they don't do well with one dose, you just go double or triple or what your physician prescribes you. But if you don't do well with only antihistamines up dose, then there is what we already spoke about, and, and we heard a very nice um, uh, history of his life, of Adil, and then you get your omalizumab. Omalizumab, yeah, misfortunately for me here working in Mexico, not available to all my patients because it's quite expensive. But it is amazing the way it changes lives of urticaria patients. And if you don't get control with omalizumab, which is a very small portion of patients, then there are immunosuppressive drugs. There are drugs that maintain the mast cell quiet, quiet, quiet. Don't get again excited, uh, anxious and, and, and get the histamine into the environment. No, no, no. Keep quiet, keep quiet. That's what the immunosuppressive drugs do. But this always should be under the supervision of now really a specialist, a specialist, a physician specialized in treating urticaria. And we're many of, we're man, there's many of us now all over the world now. Really try to avoid systemic corticosteroids. They're so good in controlling, but they're so bad in making your body worse and worse. And the total of chronic, of, of, of corticosteroids you take in your life, the total sum ends up, adds up. And at the end of your life, 
you will pay for this. You will have your osteoporosis, you'll have your bones breaking, you'll have your hypertension, et cetera, et cetera. So although for a little spare of time, you might be better in your hives, please don't go there. And avoid triggers. Now, certain drugs, like we already spoke about, aspirin or uh, the friends of aspirin, we call them, are very uh, easy that they are triggers and, and make your um, mast cells again uh, liberate histamine. Paracetamol normally is okay. Certain foods I already told you about now, like chocolate, artificial colors, there's long lists. For some patients, they can get a better, bit better controlled if they try to avoid uh, those foods who really trigger urticaria. But um, sometimes diets are not so easy to hold. So really don't go on a super diet and lose 10 kilos now. <laughs> and um, work actively on your mental well-being. I already spoke about that. I won't uh, stop here anymore. Contact your physician if you have an infection because any infection that you get once you have your wild, your, your, your hives well controlled, that infection again will make your hives go out of control. So please uh, contact your physician when you have an infection so it can be treated as soon as possible and you won't get out of control too much. Now, take your control medi med medication. This is very important, even when you say, no, I've been perfect for one week, for two weeks. No, I think I don't need it anymore. No, because then you will get activated again. And then it's again much di more difficult to lower the activation of your urticaria. So until your physician sl slowly discontinues, don't discontinue medication. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. And since you already mentioned briefly uh, the connection between nutrition and the impact it has on your urticaria, could you please shortly elaborate a little bit more about this connection between uh, digestion and urticaria severity? Yeah, How yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, well, here the, the important thing is, I always tell my patients, if you really try to avoid those foods who make the mast cell again more nervous, you know, that you more easily uh, liberates histamine, then you won't get cured of your urticaria. This is not the cause, but it is the trigger. So it will make it easier to us with one or two doses of antihistamines to control your urticaria. So those foods are, are uh, yeah, what we call, there's two groups of foods. Now, one, one group of the foods is that make the mast cell more nervous and make that it liberates histamine. And there's certain kinds of foods who already have histamine kind of uh, molecules inside the food. Now, um, yeah, there's long list. I didn't want to go into too much into detail, but for example, yeah, chocolate, um, there's the old cheeses, uh, red wine. I'm really a, a big fan of red wine and good old cheese, but those two really trigger a lot of histamine in, in the body of patients who can't tolerate now. Um, yeah, there's certain fresh fishes when you eat them. There's also some uh, molecules liberated there that very much uh, a simil uh, are, are similar to, to, to histamine. Um, what's more, uh, yeah, uh, normally for the kids, now here in Mexico, we have a lot of foods that have a lot of colors added to them. No, no, no. Those trigger the carrier very easily. And soy sauce, no? Um, the, the Chinese uh, restaurant syndrome, we call it, because they're added. Uh, so the, 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 the food has a better flavor, but those uh, additives they can also trigger hives very easily. So yeah, if your urticaria is very out of control, it would be a good idea to try to avoid those foods for a while. But uh, if your urticaria is well controlled, I always tell my patients that, well, little by little, try to get them into your diet again and don't feel too much excluded because it's also socially sometimes not so easy. No, to exclude. no I can't eat all those. And, and when you go to a restaurant, well, uh, yeah, it's, it's not nice. That is true. Thank you very much.